Today is Sunday, September 27th, 2020, and it's the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. I thought I would mention that because last week I mentioned that something about the epistle. We were talking about sanctifying grace, and I mentioned about something in the epistle or the gospel. Actually, I said gospel, and I was wrong. It was actually the epistle speaks about sanctifying grace from last week um, where St. Paul says in the epistle for this reason I bend my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth receives its name that he may grant you from his glorious riches to be strengthened with power through his spirit unto the progress of the inner man and to have Christ dwelling through faith in your hearts, so that being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know Christ's love, which surpasses knowledge, in order that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. That's sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is a supernatural gift beyond comprehension, as I mentioned before. If you were to spend years just trying to meditate upon and contemplate what grace is, the dignity of man, you'll never come close to it, understanding it. You receive a share in the divine nature, in God's own life. And then in heaven, you receive in heaven a new miraculous gift, a supernatural gift of being able to see God as He is in Himself. And it's beyond comprehension, but God's been here for all eternity. And God as the Trinity alone, without anything other than Himself, has been infinitely happy, content with Himself for all eternity for an eternity already. Our, in a manner speaking, our eternal life is shortly going to start. In a manner speaking, it has started. If you're in the state of grace, because grace that you possess today, habitual or sanctifying grace which you possess today, in sea, is the seed of glory. It's the same grace you will have in heaven. There is no difference. It's just that it is by faith now that you understand it. Now, there is another thing which I would like to read, but I don't know that I will read the whole thing. A beautiful little book called God Within Us by Plu. Another one of his wonderful gifts, uh, books. He has very many. And in here he talks about the supernatural order of grace. It's It's very revealing. It talks about what is sanctifying grace from the point of view of comparing it to other things that that God has done in in creating. For example, God created animals. And he gives to each thing that he has created a perfection of its nature. So when he creates a tree, he gives it that quality, those qualities which make it a tree. When he makes an animal, he gives the animal qualities to make it an animal so that it can live according to its nature and in a way that is God's justice. When he makes a man, he creates a man with those things, those gifts, those powers which make him a human being according to his nature. And that's all that God is bound to do in a manner of speaking. But it says in here, Revelation tells us that God, having created man, was, as if not satisfied by the result of his task, moved by a second loving impulse to add something to the wonderful gifts which constitute man's nature. Man has a body and a soul. It is enough. It constitutes the perfect nature of man. But all of God is not found there. In this, his creature. God has fulfilled his design, but he has not exhausted his love. There's a beautiful way this man puts it. He has not given enough to to satisfy himself. 
He wishes to give something more. Man shall be not only man. He shall be body and soul, yes, and something far greater besides. And God decides that man should be a participator in his own divine life. Man will still be man, but even on earth, he will be called upon to share the life of God in order that later he may be able to do more, so more completely and for all eternity in heaven. His participation will still be partial, but direct. And the mystery will lie, not so much in the fact that man should be called upon to perform a divine action, as in this other fact, that he should be called upon to perform an action essentially divine, to see God face to face, and should nevertheless remain, in spite of it, a man. You save and preserve your divine, your human nature, but you participate in the divine nature. And you do today, if you're in the state of grace. That state of grace is to last for eternity. It's the seed of your glory in heaven. It is that seed which will be able to seed God face to face. An incomparable mystery. You cannot understand it. The mystery of being able to see God as he is. And then he says, which was part of my point last week, to compare and contrast the dignity that God has given to man in the, in the gift of grace, if man will accept it and will live by those things which will not only bring him sanctifying grace, but retain it. As human beings, what we feel most is the loss of the more perceptible benefits. This is the loss of grace by Adam and Eve. And the loss of all those prerogatives that God gave to Adam and Eve and for their posterity, if they remain faithful. But they were free gifts. Anything above man's nature was a free gift by God. It was not necessary for God in creating man to give him sanctifying grace. It's not necessary. He could have created man as man, as human beings, without the divine call to see him face to face in heaven, only to contemplate him with the intellect and to know him through the knowledge of the intellect. That is all that is required for God to do in creating man. But he decided that's not enough for my love, my affection. So he did more. And then we lost it. Behold, now from henceforth we are doomed to suffer and to suffer horribly. And behold, we are now also subject to death. The principal and only really essential thing is that all our divine treasures were taken away from us and that since God had united them to us so closely that their possession or non-possession meant life or death to us. The loss of them meant eternal punishment. Because God gave us this great privilege of receiving sanctifying grace and having a divine call to eternal life and to be able to contemplate him more than contemplate, to, sh to see him face to face in heaven. Because of that, the consequences are that we, if we reject it, now we are lost. You either accept it as a thinking adult. This doesn't apply exactly to children who are under the age of use of reason. That's different. But if we as a thinking adult reject this grace, there is only one consequence, and that is we are banished from the possibility of seeing God in heaven if we reject it eternally. That is the consequence. And people have a hard time understanding the punishment of God. But that's because they don't have a good understanding or perception of faith in the fact of what God has offered them in sanctifying grace, what he is giving to them. And the rejection of it is, in a sense, infinite because of the dignity of the person they are rejecting and the laws 
and obedience to the God whom they are rejecting. It's a whole other subject. I don't want to continue on it, but the point he makes here, which I will not continue, but maybe I'll put this on the web if you want. It's a beautiful, this chapter, because this chapter is very good for a sum up of last week, but it gets into understanding there's reasons for, there are reasons for it, but he points out to make us comprehend better the offense of sin, just one sin. As he points out, God at the, at the sin of just one mortal sin of an angel, they were banished from God, from his sight. Now, they were never in heaven officially. They were, we say that St. Michael had a battle in heaven. In a manner of speaking, it was connected to heaven, let's put it that way. But it wasn't the vision of God face to face. We know that. They had to be tested before they would be given that, that great gift, that privilege. They had to be tested just like you and I are. The only difference is, is their test is very quick because of the, the infused knowledge they have from God which distinguishes man, the dignity of man, from the dignity of an angel, they have infused knowledge. So their knowledge of things is perfect. They don't have to reason things out as we do. They don't have to come slowly to the comprehension of truth, the understanding of truth. We do. And so when the angels fell, there was no redemption given by God for one sin that they each committed. But when man fell, God decided he would redeem us. And the other thing he points out is that because it's such a commonplace thing that we've heard about from childhood, we lose the comprehension of what it really means that God became a man and died for us on the cross. I, I bring it up, I will try to put that on my little blog thing that is not doing very well because I changed it and I don't know why and how to fix what I was trying to do. So if it's goofy right now, please be patient. I'm trying to fix it. Um, on top of that, I, I feel now I have talked so much in the past actually years about the dignity of your calling and what grace is you're called to not only holiness, I'm sorry, not only heaven as the reward of a faithful life on earth, but what you are really called to in this world, and that is to divine union, to divine contemplation. That's how some of the great spiritual authors talk about. They say that the call, the vocation of each man is to divine contemplation of God in this world. That's our goal. And I've talked about it, about what it is and the beauty of it, in order that we, you and I both, might have a desire to do those things which are necessary to get there, to reach the goal. Now, I'm done with that for now, at least in general. I say that. Um, I want to now start a little bit more going back to those things now that we need to talk about. To fight in ourselves. Because if you want to reach God, there is a struggle. And one great author writes about the what's called the, the third conversion of the soul. The soul needs to go through three conversions to reach Divine union, for example. The, highest, the higher levels of holiness. Very few people understand any of this. I even wonder in the few, what they call contemplative communities today, I was going to ask somebody about that that was in one. In the, these contemplative communities, are they teaching the young people what their vocation is as a contemplative? What is it? How to reach it, how to struggle, how to fight, how to dig. He, he says something about, this one author says about this third conversion, that God digs so deep and the soul 
I can't remember right now, I'm sorry, the exact word he uses, but the, the, the crucible of suffering is tremendous, is the way he puts it. The crucible of suffering that God makes the soul go through in order to reach the high levels of divine union. The, the sufferings of er, the early part of the purgative life, for example, which is where we're going to start, that which is called the purgative life, which begins after some type of a reformation, he calls it, or a first conversion. The purgative life. And obviously the word kind of gives you an idea. you got to purge. You might, you've got to change, most likely. Unless you've done it over the years already. You need to potentially. I know I do. And many things. You need to purge all the dregs of sin. Evil passions that dwell in our soul. Which I want to talk about. The St. Thomas goes into... I think there are 11 different passions that we have. The irascible and the concupiscible passions that we have inside of us and how we need to fight them. People ask, what am I supposed to do? There's a lot to do and I'm going to try to explain it. There's an awful lot to do. But it's through prayer, through meditation, mortification and reading. You need to have good books and you need to read books kind of in the right order. If you put the books out of order, you're most likely going to get lost. Believe me. You need to have some order to your reading. And some books are higher, and they talk about higher things, but they're not necessarily for us at this point in time. So we got to be careful with what we read, when we read it. But to read, you should do. Some serious and good older books. So, we want to get into understanding. I also want to talk about what's called our predominant fault. Very important. The predominant fault that we all have. It stems from and is related to our temperaments. And I have more than a class all prepared for that. But I can't get into it today. I realize I give up. I can't. I will be going too fast. I need to go back a little bit yet. And I want to start continuing where I left off last week about sin. And I will explain about sin because it's a, you need the foundation of sin. You need to understand what sin is. For example, somebody asked me a while ago on a little card, they asked me, could you talk about sins uh, related to the third commandment? Thou shalt keep holy Lord's day. A, a commandment that is violated by most everybody. I'm not saying you, but people I know in the world, Catholics, non-Catholics, they ignore it. They don't consider it at all. But in the Old Testament, it was very important because God said, he who violates this law, let him be put to death. That's how stringent. Now, the old law is different, obviously, than the new law for reasons. But it doesn't mean the commandments are different. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. It has been changed by the church, by the power the church has had, from Saturday to Sunday because of our Lord's resurrection, because of Pentecost. So, keep hold of the Lord's day, which means thou shalt not do things that are not permitted on the Sabbath. What do those things entail? Does everybody understand? I hope you do. But, I have found out that most people don't have a good understanding. For example, one person told me not too long ago, a couple of years ago actually, um, and I didn't say anything because they weren't asking anything and I, maybe I was wrong and maybe I should still tell them the truth, but they said, well, you know what, I can go home and garden in my garden today even though it's Sunday because it's fun. But fun is not the difference between something that is manual labor and not manual labor. So the church teaches what is forbidden on Sunday. Manual labor. Unnecessary manual labor. So, for example, a fireman, if there's a fire on a Sunday, he doesn't wait till Monday morning to go put it out. 
it would be a little foolish. His job is he's got to take care of fires on Sunday, too. So if it, he gets called, he goes. And that's an exception because it's necessary. So unnecessary, servile work. Well, what is servile work? I like gardening. Other people like cleaning their cars. Other people like cutting a lawn. I like painting. I like overhauling engines. But just because I like it doesn't mean I can do it. The church tells us what is manual labor, what is servile work on Sunday. That is not permitted. So, to form our conscience, we need to understand what is servile work. Servile work that is unnecessary is not permitted. So, I can't do it. If I do, I offend God. If I do it for ten minutes, I offend God. If I do it for four hours, I offend God. The only difference between those two is one is a venial sin. In theory, one is a venial sin. Everything else being the same or understood properly. One is the venial sin, one's a mortal sin. So where does the mortal sin start and the venial sin end? Do we all understand that? Now, it's not the subject of today's talk to explain that, because I, I will explain that maybe when we get into this, the commandments. But today I'm trying to, I want to explain to you why it is important to understand and to form a conscience. And I want to talk about conscience as we go. These things are all related because if you don't have a good conscience and you don't understand something so simple that as an adult you need to know, it is part of your vocation to know what it means to not offend God by the, 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 the third commandment. There are other things about the third commandment people should know too. People watch four football games on a Sunday. It's not, it's not right. That's violating God's law. Because the day is supposed to be holy to some degree. And four football games kind of takes up most of the day. Most of the mind of what the mind is supposed to be thinking about on Sunday. The beauty of grace. The beauty of the sacrament you received in the morning, potentially. So, the point is, is that to, to live in God's grace and to not offend Him, we need to do, we need to avoid those things that we know, for example, that are wrong. Is that not correct? It is. Everyone knows that. But, Many people, I would say most people today, are ignorant of what is right and wrong. So if people get married, for example, just as an example, and they live completely contrary to, to right morals in their married life, they're responsible. I'm sorry to say it that way. But they're responsible for sins committed, even though they don't know. Why? Because you're taking on yourself a vocation, a duty, an obligation, a right. All these things are related to a vocation of marriage. Similar with a priest. If a priest takes on himself the vocation of becoming a priest, and he allows the bishop to lay his hands on him to make him a consecrated priest, he has the duty to know the, what it means to be a priest and how to live that life properly. And if he fails to do that, he sins. Oh, well, he was ignorant of the fact that this little thing he should have been teaching people in confession. So he's teaching people wrong in confession. Well, he was ignorant of that. It's no excuse. Why? Because he took a vocation upon himself that, he, that demands by God that he know the truth. It's apparent allowing their children to receive sacraments when they haven't a clue what they're doing. If they have no clue what they're doing in receiving the sacrament, it's not right. Same with the sacrament of marriage. So, what I'm trying to point out is knowledge is very necessary because this is the distinction now between vincible and invincible ignorance. And for vincible ignorance, we are responsible for those things that we do with this ignorance. Why? Because vincible ignorance is ignorance that I am bound and I have an obligation not to have. 
that I need to know the truth. And people go so far as they don't want to know the truth. And sadly enough, some people don't want others to know the truth. That is our condition today. I would like to be able to explain the truth to you on all these matters that I have prepared for today, but you don't want to be here till 2 o'clock. And I need to eat lunch sometime later, too. So, but I would like to be able to spend more time because I'm only giving you in... I'm watching the clock, but I'm still... I'm trying to give you a little bit of where we're going and why these things are very important to spur you on to the desire to continue to fight against yourself because these things are difficult. And man is naturally inclined to laziness. We are naturally inclined to things that are pleasant and not to things that are difficult. But if you want pleasant, if you want happiness, this is the road. This is the road. So, I don't want to belabor the point if I haven't already, um, but this is, this is important, and I hope you will follow a little bit of what I have today and then come back, because there are a lot that I've got actually prepared, but it's too much for today. I want to go back now. What I was trying to do last week, and I don't think I did a really good job of it, is try to make sure that we all understand, because I don't, and nobody does well, I would say, thoroughly, understand what sin is. When I put this on the web, if you read this little thing and you think about it, pray over it, it will help you. This is this little quote from, or this chapter from Raoul Plu on God within us. Um, to help us to understand what sin is, not only mortal sin, especially mortal sin, but even venial sin, to understand what it is. To, it, it's good to think about this, even though it's not real pleasant. It's good to think about why. Because then we will be more careful in the future. Naturally, you should be, even though you may already be. Um, what is sin? Sin is an offense against God. But we don't see God, do we? I mean, we people saw our Lord when he became a man, so they saw his human nature. They didn't see, in a manner of speaking, his divine nature. He saw the workings of his divine nature coming through in what he did as a man. They saw his miracles. Always, our Lord always says, not like they did, other people have said, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, is what the apostle said when, after the ascension and Pentecost, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, receive your sight, for example. And they would be cured. Um, but that's because he was God. But our Lord always said, which was so different, I say to thee, arise, young man, get up and walk. Receive your sight. I say to thee, receive your sight. I say to thee, be cleansed of your leprosy, which is a symbol of sin. Be cleansed. I say that. Why? Because he was God. He had the divine power. He didn't need to ask his father to perform the miracle directly because he and the Father were one, as he told the people and the apostles. But now, to understand better sin, there are two analogies I want to use. And they ha both have a little bit different aspect to them, so I want to maybe use both of them. One has to do with a man, for example, who is guilty of grave offenses against the state against the king, for example, of years ago. And the judge calls the man, and the jury accuses him of great crimes. And the jury says this man is deserving of punishment, to be cast out of society, 
and to work in hard labor for the rest of his life. And the man is, by the judge, is given a sentence of life, of hard labor. And at the last moment, the man falls on his knees and begs the judge, Your Honor, out of the depths of my heart, I plead with you to forgive me, because I am contrite and sorrowful for what I have done. And the judge says, okay, I will forgive you. And the man is freed. And it's a wonderful act. And understanding the way kingdoms were years ago, I can understand that there was some of this that probably took place. And then the man is brought again three months later. He's brought again before the same judge with the same crimes. Once again. Now what does the judge do? And there's another example, which is a very theoretical example, because I can't imagine it has happened before. But it, because of that, just because of that fact, I think the example is good because it will help us to understand the gravity of sin. A man and a woman fall in love. I've used this example before. And after years of marriage, the man falls into adultery. A grave sin. A grave offense against his wife. Against God. A double sin. I don't know if you know that. It's a, a double mortal sin. Do you know that? In one act, a person can commit many mortal sins, depending upon the, the virtues which he violates. Okay? The virtue of obedience to God and justice in his vow, against his vow. So, the man's guilty. And his wife finds out. And the man after great sincere sorrow, pleads with her to forgive him. This could take months. The man would do anything to return to the way it was before he did and committed this fault, this sin. And it makes, in a sense, if you put it in perspective, it makes a Lent of 40 days of penance in a sense, look kind of shy or small to make up for offenses against God. If only those 40 days could make up and make, in a sense, his wife forget the offense he committed. Not so much because of how he feels, but because of what he's done to his wife, whom he truly loves. At least he thought, and he does to some degree. So, I'm not even going to say it, but let's say she forgives him, and that's great. And it has happened, this type of thing. But if it happens again, do you really think the wife is going to feel his sincerity to be sincere? It's hard for me to believe. And that's why in the, this is related to early in the church. You know the error that went around early in the church. There was only once you could go to confession, especially for denial of the faith. That was a potential sin back then because if they found out you were a practicer of the Catholic faith, they cut your head off. And that's a punishment, and it's a scary one. Not many people want to lose their head when they're 15, 16 years old especially. Even 60. <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter. You don't want to lose your head. You want to stand up for your faith, yes. Today it's a little easier in a manner of speaking to do that. But back then, many people were said, you can't go to confession twice for that sin. Once is it. 
And the church had to come out and say, no, that is wrong. That is an error. Confession is for those who repent. But you must have true contrition. We need to talk about contrition too. What is contrition? What is sorrow? What is attrition? What is supernatural sorrow? And what is natural sorrow? What is necessary for the sacrament of penance? Not all sorrow for sin is sufficient for the sacrament of penance. We need to understand which is. And you probably do, but it's sometimes good to review it to make sure. So, this example of the adultery, it's, I, I think it's almost like it's a rhetorical question. Do I need to even say if, if the man did it again, would she ever forgive him? Maybe. I. But with God, if people commit the same sin over, let's say every, every three to six months, a man commits the same sin. How does God look at that? And God looks at, if you only want to understand, read the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16. You want to understand, God looks upon sin as adultery. Chapter 16 of Ezekiel. He first talks about what he did in giving man grace. In, and he describes it by clothing a lady in beautiful garments and rings for her fingers and earrings for her ears and all the beauty that a woman could possess with all this that he gave her. And then he talks about adultery because that's the way God sees sin as an act of adultery. So that's why that analogy I tried to use about adultery is related because that's the way God sees our sins as an act of offense of that degree. He has wed us to himself. We are his brides, the spouses of Christ. Not just people who take on themselves the religious, the beautiful religious life, the contemplative life, a beautiful life, to what it leads for a beautiful soul, the contemplative life. If you can find it, it's a beautiful thing. But what God does for these souls and calls them to be his spouse in a special way. And then what does our, our sin do? God looks upon it that way. And if you think about it, meditate upon this type of thing. It's helpful not to be negative. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to help us to have a better perception of what sin is so that we don't commit it. And that the things that I talked about in terms of the interior life will help to draw us to those things and away from sin. You need to know and understand both in order to live a good Catholic life. You need to understand what proper morals are. Unfortunately, I have so little time to talk that I don't get to much. So, after that, what I thought I would do is go back to what sin is. Last week we talked about sin, as you remember, and the punishments for sin. Okay. One of the things to understand the, the gravity of sin is to understand what our Lord did in redeeming us. His passion and death if you were the only person and only committed one mortal sin, you have to see our Lord's passion is that he would have done that whole thing just for you. That is my understanding. For what I have learned, that that's the way we will see it in heaven. That our Lord died on the cross just for you. Just for me. Is the way we will understand it. And then we talked about the effects of mortal sin. Sister Lucy describes it in her, what she saw at the vision at Fatima, what happens to souls that are lost. And then the Blessed Mother showed them this vision to these little children. 
And yet many of us, or people I've talked to in the past, are afraid to talk about sin and the consequences of sin. Even though the Blessed Mother showed it and explained it to a little girl, nine years old, eight years old, little Jacinta. So, now, what we want to know, what are the requirements for sin? So, one thing to start with that I want to explain, which is a big question for people, I think, many times. This gets into conscience, which we will go into hopefully someday more about conscience, so that you understand the details of conscience. But sin, when does sin take place? Sin takes place at the moment that we posit some act, that we do something, that we perform an action, or make a decision in our intellect, for example, that we give credence to with our will. Where is sin committed? As you know, the two parts of the human soul, the intellect and the will. Sins are not committed in your intellect. Just know that. It's very important to understand, especially for sins of impurity, for example. Sins of hatred. Sins of revenge. Where is the sin committed? It's not in the intellect. I sometimes have, unfortunately, thoughts of revenge because they just come naturally when somebody, if somebody pokes you with a knife, I mean, you, you, there's a natural reaction. Um, and until we become holy, let's say like some of the saints who wouldn't have been bothered by being poked by a knife, like St. Benedict Joseph Robbery, when that man threw a rock at him, hit him in the leg, he started bleeding, he picked up the rock, kissed it, put it down in the corner of the road, and continued on his way. He never even looked up to see who threw it. Never even looked up. But when is, where is sin committed? Sin is not committed in your intellect. So if you have bad thoughts, no matter what they are, they're not yet sins. They're temptations, potentially. And I want to just add something, because it came to mind today, and I thought it would posit. I'm jumping around a little bit, but it's all related. Um, because of understanding sin, and there um, sins, as I mentioned before, against the virtue of purity. Um, we must, as you know, avoid the occasions of sin. And if things are an occasion of sin, we must put them out of our life. That is one requirement. You cannot live with an occasion of sin, which is a grave occasion of sin for you. You can't live with it without doing something to make it not so grave. To make it a remote, what's called a remote occasion of sin. So, uh, for a drunkard, having a bottle of wine or whatever he is attached to or likes, uh, sitting in front of him can be a, a grave occasion of sin. Um, but a bar down the street is a proximate occasion of sin. As long as he doesn't go there, the bar is probably not going to encourage him to commit the sin. Um, a near occasion of sin, for example, against the Sixth Commandment today, from what I have learned from a priest that has given talks about this type of thing that I heard about, he talks about how rampant it is today about sins that are committed by some of our technologically advanced little pieces of toys, I will call them toys, that everybody often carries with them in their pocket or has on their desk at home. And if these things are an occasion of sin, a grave occasion of sin, they need to be put out. Why do I say this? Partly because the requirements for confession, you may not know, but the requirements for confession, if a person falls into a grave sin is that they can't retain the occasion of sin. If they retain the occasion of sin, it means what? There isn't that contrition I talked about that is required. The contrition is not there. It's not sincere. Why? Because I'm not sincere enough to say I'm going to remove the occasion. So, if, for example, my cell phone is an occasion of grave occasion of near occasion of sin for me, I need to get rid of it in some way, to make it a remote occasion. 
That is a requirement. Otherwise, I can go to confession all day. I can go to all three priests here on one Sunday. The sin won't be it will not be forgiven by any of them. Because I don't have the requirements necessary for contrition, my contrition to be acceptable to God. It's like the man that comes back the third time after adultery. You're really not sorry. Well, yes, I am. No, you're not. So, the, the point is that's the occasion of sin. Where is sin committed? Not in the intellect. If an occasion of sin comes into the intellect, an impure thought, or a thought of revenge to somebody you don't like, I, but it, that naturally, sometimes people, there are people you're not going to like in life. I don't like certain people. I don't like to be around them, but I still have to love them. I need to pray for them, to prove my love for them. I need to pray for their salvation and wish for their salvation, their holiness. That's required. Do I have to like them and to be friends with them? No. But the occasion that the sin is not in my intellect. But this is where people get confused about temptation. I have an impure thought in my mind. What do I do? I reject it with my will because my sin is committed in my will. If I take pleasure in the thought, the impure thought, for example, the thought of revenge, if I revel in it, waiting to do it, I can't wait to bonk the guy over the head. Then, if I give credence to the thought by reveling in the thought, by giving credence to it with my will, that's the moment that I give credence to it and I commit the sin. Not when the thought comes to my intellect. I can have bad thoughts all day, which can happen to people, who have, especially those who have lived bad lives, or who allow themselves to be in occasions of sin more often than they should. The thoughts come back. And then they place them, they, they leave those thoughts there or they can't get rid of them because it's hard to get rid of thoughts until you are practiced in mortification, which we are going to talk about. That's all part of your road. Mortification of the mind. Mortification of the imagination. Mortification of the memory. These are all the things that we need to do. They're all in part of my talk for today, which would go until four o'clock if I were to finish because there's so much. But it's all important. The, the thought and people you wouldn't believe have a misunderstanding of this. They completely misunderstand. They think sin is in my intellect. It's not. It's in my will. So the thought is not the sin. It is the giving credence to it and reveling in it with my will. That's where I choose between good and evil. My mind only presents it to my will as a supposed good, actually evil. But it tells my will, this is wrong, but it's really pleasurable. So follow it. And the will says, no. No sin is committed no longer, no matter how long that thought stays in the intellect. As long as it's rejected by the will, no sin is committed, you are meriting. And this is what God sends temptations often for, that you might merit an eternal reward for that one little act of repelling a sinful thought, which, without grace, you cannot do. Impossible. You cannot do it without grace. Actual grace of God. Not possible. God does all. As our Lord said, without me you can do nothing. So, you are working and acting in a supernatural way when you repel evil you are doing a supernatural act and you will receive a supernatural reward in heaven that will make your heaven so much greater than you can even ever imagine just for that one act, which only takes a moment. But sometimes in regards to temptations, they can last all day. Just imagine the merit you gain. Don't think that because the temptation stayed there so long that I must be committing a sin somehow. No, as long as it's rejected by the will, no sin is committed. And stay firm. Don't let the devil tweak you and, and confuse you that this thought has to do with sin and therefore you've already given in. Give up. You've already given in because you can't get rid of it. Therefore, you must want it. No, not true. I don't want it. And I refuse it. 
And we can talk later how to do that and then start getting into the three things that make a sin mortal. But I hope this is helpful as a start. We want to go down this path. For those that are interested in the interior life in a serious way, to the purpose of your life, divine contemplation, this foundation now is necessary. You will often hate it. I still hate it. This week was terrible because I started to think about things in my own life that I should have known years ago that come back to me because these sins haunt you sometimes because you never get to the bottom of them and they keep coming back. But that is the path that glorifies God and wins you an eternal reward. Thank you for coming. I hope I see you next week. And if you have any complaints about my class, please let me know. Thank you. You're welcome.